Good evening and welcome to St. Louis Design Week 2013. My name is Margaret McDonald. I'm a principal Arcturus and this year's Design Week chair. When I was approached to work on this event, I decided to do it because I believe that the awareness and celebration of good design is important for our community. This year's theme is Design Is. We chose this because we wanted a diverse group of design professionals from landscape architects to graphic designers, from architects to photographers to participate. I've seen so many disciplines represented in the crowd tonight, and I want all of you to know how much we appreciate you being part of St. Louis Design Week. We hope that you'll participate in several of the events this week. Before we start tonight's discussion, I want to thank our financial supporters, partners, and volunteers. You recognize the importance of our goals and the brilliance of our design community. Design Week would not be possible without your time and your support. Thank you. And now let me introduce Lisa Melandri, Director of the Contemporary Art Museum St. Louis. <laughs> Hi, good evening, welcome. So this is a really extraordinary opportunity for us because it is indeed a twofer. This is the beginning and the launch of uh, St. Louis Design Week, but it is also the first in a series of programs that we have put together to give context to this museum and to celebrate the 10th anniversary of this building. We are um, extremely thrilled that you are all here to be able to see the current exhibition called Place is the Space, which was actually co-curated by Brad Klopfill, from whom you've heard, you will hear in a few minutes, and Dominic Malone. And the whole idea of this exhibition was to really look at the bones of this building and to very many extraordinary and unique parts of it and really help us see it anew through artists' work. So we are thrilled that you're here and have a chance to see it and certainly we invite you after the conversation to take a look around. I am going to introduce Eric Hoffman who will do a more formal and complete introduction of our panelists but I will say that it is a pleasure to really think about what architecture for art means. Um, as someone who is not an architect but who works with art and contemporary art every day and understands the vicissitudes, the strangenesses and the expansive definition of what that can be, it is particularly uh, satisfying to hear from architects who really think about that when they are designing these kinds of buildings. With that, I will uh, have Eric take it away and thank you so much for coming. It is a pleasure to have you. Thank you, Lisa. Are we on here? Can everyone hear me? No? Can everyone hear me? Well, welcome to the Contemporary Art Museum on what is a wonderful fall evening and which promises to be a spirited and insightful discussion. And it's a pleasure to share in the 10th anniversary of this remarkable institution. And I have to say, it's a uh, welcome to relief to see, um, and to see this building breathe again. And so to, um, to Brad, congrats. Um, my name is Eric Hoffman. I'm a professor of practice at Washington University. And I'm also an associate with St. Louis-based Trivers Associate. To date, to date, my career has been dedicated to architecture for the arts and in support of cultural institutions and their larger missions, most notably with prominent roles in the design and construction of Minneapolis's Walker Art Center and our very own St. Louis Art Museum. So I was delighted with the invitation to moderate this panel, um, which is entitled Architecture for Art. Additionally, it is my great pleasure to share the evening with two internationally recognized design leaders, Brad Klopfill and Kyu Sung Woo. Their work is rooted in place, material, program, and light. They've both been instrumental in the realization of two of our region's most cherished institutions. Surrounding us now, the Contemporary Art Museum, St. Louis, by Allied Works Architecture, and the Nerman Museum of Contemporary Art on the campus of Johnson County Community College in Kansas City. These two institutions share both scale and mission and a provocative relationship to the respective locale. These works will certainly reveal themselves in a new light this evening, and let's take a brief look at some of their work. There's Brad. <laughs> On the left, the Contemporary Art Museum where we sit now, and on the right, the Nerman Museum on the campus of Johnson County Community College. Allied Works Architecture. 
Brad Klopfil of Portland-based Allied Works Architecture has invested the last 20 years in developing a signature body of work. His work is as informed by the land and the history of place as it is by formal training. The recently completed Clifford Still Museum in Denver opened to critical acclaim. It sits quietly against the foil of the Denver Art Museum. Building on the success of St. Louis's contemporary in 2003 spurred Allied Works involvement in the development-driven Seattle Art Museum. The thoughtful repurposing of Edward Durrell Stone's two Columbus Circle into the Museum of Art and Design followed with additional regent cultural works at the University of Michigan and overseas. Kyu Sung Woo Architects. Born in Seoul, Korea, Kyu Sung Woo of Cambridge-based Kyu Sung, Sung Woo Architects is a device, diverse practice ranging in scale from residences to urban scale interventions. The office endeavors to give physical form to the practical concerns and intangible aspirations unique to each project. The Nerman is an extraordinary museum that delights, informs, and inspires as it reveals itself through subtlety and aperture. The office continues to explore all scales of work, maintaining a strong interest in the arts, notably the Arts of Korea Gallery at the Metropolitan Museum of Art and the Wonghae Museum in Seoul, Korea. And for the past decade, Kyu Sung has focused on the realization of the Asian, Asian cultural complex, complex in Korea. And so with that, I think we have a good foundation to begin this evening's discussion. Um, so just briefly, I'll introduce, introduce the, um, the format. There will be three topics. Um, the first one entitled Boundaries, the second one entitled Rooms for Art, and the third entitled Intersections and Trajectories. I'll direct the first question to Brad. Because of where we are today or tonight, the Contemporary Art Museum St. Louis in its infancy was referred to as the Forum for Contemporary Art. Did the notion of a forum influence your initial position for this project? Uh, no, yeah, no question. Absol absolutely correct. Before I begin, I have to thank Kyu Sung for coming tonight to... Is my mic on? They're working on it. Oh, they're working on it. Oh, that's better. Le <laughs> lean into it. I'll just pick it up. <laughs> um, thank Kyu Sung for coming tonight to, you know, to sit in another architect's work and discuss architecture is a very gracious, very gracious act. So. It's great to have him here. Um, so, so to that point, the Forum for Contemporary Art. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's a, it's a non-collecting institution. It was and is, which, is, which makes it more of an open matrix, I think, than, than other forms of, of cultural buildings. And, um, and I also think it was a moment in St. Louis, you know, where you basically look out the windows and very little of that was there. Right, um, and, and so something that was more immediate to the street, now that the wind is open, right? Exactly. <laughs> that you can see all the you way through. You can see through, through it now. Yeah, yeah you can see through to the Sarah. Um, but something that was a more immediate to the context um, had a presence on the street. We talked. I talked about this before many times. That that kind of set a, a new limit, an edge to the street, which didn't exist when there's so few buildings actually giving any definition to the public domain, certainly at that time. So it sets that kind of limit and yet invites people in in some way or, or establishes somewhat of an ambiguous boundary on the, on the street itself. It was very much in the nature of the institution. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and Forum for Contemporary Art was, was a perfect name for that beginning, I think. Was there any um, particular aspirations as it, as it in terms of a focus on art and its relationship to the Forum and what was intended to be here? Well, it would be, no one knew what was going to be here. I mean, that's the nature of a non-collecting, you know, Kunsthal. No one knows. So you, you make an open matrix for things to happen. You, mm -hmm. hope, you hope it inspires conditions like the, the, the burned cube and some of the other things that are here tonight. I mean, that's, that's the aspiration of a space like this, that it's a catalyst. And Kyu Sung. Um, just as we were describing here, the, the contemporary was in a transition period 
when this building was undertaken. The Nerman was in a similar circumstance when you were brought in, in terms of the collection being um, forwarded and, and bestowed onto the, the college. Was there any um, influence of transition, or how did transition affect the, uh, the process at the Nerman? I think first I would also like to congratulate. <laughs> it's 10 years, and I've seen four museums today. This is fantastic city, and it's experience. <laughs> Uh, so it's, it's great to be able to see it. Actually, I want to come because I want to see the buildings. <laughs> uh, I think Nurman was a situation where uh, I think there are two museums after looking at today. Quite a similar, I mean, similarity, but quite a differences too. Uh, both site as well as the mission itself. The, the, the Nurman is interesting place where when I had actually first interview that uh, entire campus, I never seen any campus or any place in the world where the contemporary art and daily life is so intermingled. It is part of it throughout the whole campus. And it's not, the collection was, I think they started about, I think uh, almost 20 years ago. And those were already there. So it's a transition was more about, they found a patron who is willing to put uh, the facilities and so forth. So the task was, how do we make, for me at least, the way I saw is that how do we make the best use out of all the things which exist for 20 years? And this became kind of moment to realize that. Anything you'd like to add in terms of the role of a transitioning institution? Mm -hmm, as, as a, how it affected uh, your process or the aspirations here, Brett? It's, it's, it's interesting because it also has to do with the, the nature of the architecture and the architects chosen, and I think this somewhat applies to, to both of us. You know, there, there are, I think, in aspiring institutions such as this, um, one might say that there's also a responsibility to commission architecture rather than collect architecture, right? And I, in this building, you know, they, they interviewed some pretty spectacular architects at the time, um, but they chose to go with yeah a then younger architect. Um, it's just ten years, Jesus! Nobody told me you would come back in ten years. That was that was never part of the of the realism. Yeah, yeah, that was never part of the understanding. It's like who knew ten years? Um, but um, you know they, they chose to take a risk and to and to rather co than to collect. I mean, you know, next door, one of the most beautiful pieces of collected architecture in the country, right? And they juxtaposed it with something that at the time was a great risk. And I think that's if if institutions such as the Forum and the Contemporary Art Museum take on that responsibility to commission art and to commission architecture, I think it's a great act for culture in the United States, and it needs, it needs to happen more, I think. Well, I think it's a perfect lead into another topic, which is, I think both of these works, um, and I think these two works in particular are the ones that are sort of the most um, in question this evening, between the Nerman and the, um, the contemporary, is they both serve as foils against sort of a very provocative context. Uh, in the case of the Nerman, you have a community college, an educational setting, and a suburban campus. Um, for you, Brad, the, you know, um, the adjacency to the Pulitzer Foundation and what was, as you said earlier, sort of um, somewhat of a non-existent context, could, could both of you expand on the idea of FOIL and how that affected your, uh, your work? I think context was, uh, I mean, the, in case of Nerman, uh, it is, as you mentioned, it's, uh, it's a suburban. It's, uh, it's a suburban in Midwest, it's vast, the place, and it's community college. It's more like a shopping mall because it's- It is uh, like a shopping yeah, mall. Shopping mall that there's a mall in the middle, and, uh, and then the, uh, most of the buildings were built around the 70s, all the brick buildings. And scale was kind of coarse and so forth. Uh, there, I think the our the my attempt was to make a in a way it had to be different because also building size wise this is much smaller than others, so intentionally made a very different gesture 
but it became a kind of gateway for the campus as well as for the, uh, the beginning of the journey for the rest of the artwork. Uh, that's kind of uh, the connection with the rest of the campus. Uh -huh. But there's a material difference as well. And well, maybe you could talk about the material difference. Uh, material, uh, it's all dark brick. Entire campus is dark brick and asphalt, the parking space, that's mainly it. And in this case, uh, I chose the uh, limestone. And limestone, uh, this interesting case because not started with actually uh, limestone uh, selection, but actually underground, uh, the knoll there, that land, within a foot below is all limestone. Mm -hmm. And actually, original intent was that we like to expose some of it and then connect it to it. Uh, the, as a result, that limestone uh, as a color, it contrasts with dark brick substantially, mm -hmm. so it became a piece marking that point. And did that foil, did the, um, the relationship to the existing context, you know, you've talked about this vast yard in front of it um, in our previous discussions. It, was there any impact or any influence of the foil in your attitude or the building's opportunities as it, as it results um, in the opportunities for art for the institution? Uh, or was it purely an architectural I think, relationship? Uh, uh, I think in this instance that art, architecture is uh, one moment of uh, experiencing art in larger context. Uh, the sculpture garden is uh, substantial in front of the building. Between the building and the major traffic uh, art arterial, there is a sculpture garden, and then this building. And then this building should signal uh, the, what is behind it. Uh, that's where I think I start thinking about actually working with artists yeah. to have. So in some ways, the there. art, the sculpture garden, really is the, the intermediary. It is the sort of the it thing is, that right, buffers right. between right. the existing and the new. Right. It's, it's interesting It's interesting to me to think, I mean, Q Sung's building in a, that's in a community college. It's community college. That's crazy. <laughs> it I is, mean, it's an extraordinary place. It's really and, and, it, and it, it's so beautiful and it, it makes me think of how buildings come to be and, and the, the community will that creates these institutions. And, you know, many, many times it's a, the act of an individual you know, of a powerful or visionary individual. The Seattle Art Museum is another case study that it was really the head librarian that made that happen. It was really one person insisted on that quality of architecture and that kind of innovation. Um, so there's, a lot of times there's one person that, that supplies the vision and leadership, but also just the way cities, I mean, you, you think of St. Louis and how many arts buildings they have. I mean, it's, it's an incredible, Thing and it, it makes one wonder, you know, why St. Louis, you know, why St. Louis, and where that will to culture, you know, into, into innovation comes from. You know, it's, it's in the soul of a place, I guess. You know, it's it's an ongoing question for me. And every time we get a new project, it's so fascinating to try to understand why it's, you know, like really why is it happening? Is it is it happening just to house, you know, some like I think Seattle, a large part of it because they. There were some amazing contemporary collections in Seattle, and they didn't want them to leave. So it was, if you build it, they will come, and they built it, and they did come. And those collections stayed in Seattle, you know. But but why would one build the Contemporary Art Museum of St. Louis? I mean, it's it's still it's still a relevant question because there aren't that many non-collecting institutions in the country, no, and, it's, and, it's and, a very and, thing. and you have an incredibly vital one, and it, it's a kind of gift that people gave gave the community, but you, you know, when you think, is it based on money, is it based on history, or, or what is it? But there's a will that creates these acts of culture mm -hmm. in the middle of a community college in Kansas City, right? Yeah. I mean, it's, it's an amazing thing to think about. It's, an, it's, it's one of the more exciting components, I think, of being involved in this dialogue of culture is to watch how it manifests itself in different communities. Well, I think there's a couple of topics that could come from this. One relates to program that I think we can get into in a little while. But um, I think the other thing that's interesting about the way you discuss it is, you know, even the way you talk about your work um, and sort of being sort of rooted in a place and the history of a particular place and the way you're sort of relating it to the culture and the sort of um, conditions of the art um, arts community, right, for a particular place is, is interesting as well. 
Um, maybe another question for Kyu Sung. Uh, this is um, something that I've struggled with um, in, in some of my past experiences, and I would love to hear, um, obviously, from you both, but to, to start with Kyu Sung, because I think there's a, a direct link to the Nerman. Um, but the Nerman family, at least in my research, spoke about the notion of three S's, for lack of a better term, the searching, securing, and the sharing of their collection, which really is the root of that institution. Um, and so there is this sort of conflicting role where the museum is at one time a protector and sort of the, um, the ability to share work with future generations, yet to make it accessible. Um, you know, in some circles this is argued as sort of precious versus non-precious conditions. And um, so I don't know, maybe you could just sort of share about how the, the intentions of this family carried over into the museum and, and, and your position on this sort of conflicting role in a museum and as it relates to the art. The uh, one thing is that the Berman family actually was uh, for the building, but collections was the, uh, the uh, contribution came from Oppenheimers. And, uh, Oh, uh, actually the uh, Oppenheimers, Marty and Tony Oppenheimer, they contributed about uh, almost $50 million worth of collections. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. So it's not Norman, that yeah, yeah. Oppenheimer, that's the different one clarification. But uh, there are a couple of reasons why they have uh, collections. Uh, the one thing is that as I was told that as a teaching uh, university, the college related uh, the facility that the collection helps for teaching, for curriculum. So it's kind of mission-wise, the mm -hmm. education is the main one, so for that purpose, I think uh, the collection was an important part of it. And also, incidentally, they had a patron who could bring that, uh, the, the, contribute that. Uh, and I think, uh, actually, I talked with the director lately that um, they see uh, it's kind of they like to, uh, uh, they see it's uh, not necessarily one or another, but I think they would like to achieve both of it. The balancing. That, the balancing of it, mm -hmm. because uh, because the institution is a teaching institution, they need collections, yet they would like to reach out and for the future, and uh, uh, that's the way it is. Yeah. So there, it's a balancing act and sort right. of the right. influence of the, the mission of the institution as well, right? right. That it's and a teaching they, opportunity. Right. I think they consider it's more complementary, so it is not uh, contradicting those yeah. two. And Brad, I, you know, I, I'm actually quite interested in this sort of, uh, the approach of sort of a non-precious sort of condition for the art. I don't know if that came into play here, where it's a non-collecting institution, or, you know, what was the... Uh, the impact here. It's, it's interesting because arts institutions play such a distinct role to serve either the nature of the collection and or the place in which the community in which they exist, right? And I think those two things are sort of equally powerful in the, in the evolution of, of, a, of a place. And it's, it, it's interesting whether you see something, I mean like, I think that part of the reason this building could have its voice was because of the Pulitzer next door, right? The, the, the Pulitzer is, is more of a chapel. It's, it's really a sanctuary, mm -hmm. right? It's this beautiful, serene place that happens to have some spectacular art, which never hurts. <laughs> <laughs> never, ever hurts, right? But then, but then the, the nature and mission of, of the contemporary was to be other, you know, was to be something less precious and more open and, and, and you know, more changeable and mm -hmm. dynamic. And, but then at the same time, what's fascinating, again, the more I do this thing, is you realize there's the nature of the architecture and the, the original mission, and then there's the programming and how one then uses the instrument of the building. Right? I, th I think there's some dynamism in the programming of the Pulitzer that maybe no one expected, frankly. I mean, certainly in the beginning, I think. right. And, and I think that happens in a, in a lot of institutions. I mean, you, you, can make, you can make a building that provides a place for a certain mission, but the way it's acted upon, either by the art or the curators and the director, makes it, you know, it, it, it can transform the perception. I mean, for me, I, I talked about it a little bit a few weeks ago when I was here. That's the most surprising thing, as you 
you set this thing in motion, you know, you, you start this conversation with the architecture, and you have no idea what's, I mean, that's really the beauty and the joy of it. You have no idea what's going to happen. And it's, it's thrilling to come back and see how things evolve. I mean, that's, for me, it's thrilling to watch the two institutions together and the conversation and how it, and you're, you're incredibly lucky to, to be able to see it month by month. Well, and I've, think, I've, I go ahead. Having, uh, I think having uh, these two institutes next to it is fantastic. So different. It's so complement. I mean, it, together it makes the this part of the world really something. Very There's dynamic. a gravity yeah, there. It's, isn't it's there? fantastic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's really yeah. amazing. And that, that in that way, I think precious or non-precious, whatever how we describe it, it's good to have both. It's good to have both. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. I agree. Yeah. <laughs> well, in, when when we did just to, it's it's interesting when we did the Clifford Still Museum, which you showed, right? I mean, it was for a single artist. But it was also in the context of like such incredible exuberance. That's a polite term, um, but you know, but really, I mean, a kind of a kind of civic exuberance and, and sort of the you know the big show. It was the big game, and so to have the opportunity. Well, and historically, right? The original Denver Art Museum, the yeah, library, the, no, Art the whole thing. No, and, and and rightfully so in many ways, frankly, because they're civic buildings and they're representing the civic aspiration. And to have the chance to make, in that case, then something that is more of a sanctuary, you know, the counterpoint, to take that single collection and to make a kind of space and experience that didn't exist in that context, right? To, to, to use that to make a, a, a cultural counterpoint was really exciting. And it was very clear what role that could play in that city. So every context is different that way. It's, 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 it's how it finds its place in that cultural conversation given whatever the nature of the collection is, but the, the, they really are those two things together. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, maybe just a topic that we can spend just a brief moment on, but I think it's important is, um, before we move, move on, is museums and institutions tend to have multiple clients you know, commissions and bodies of, you know, of people that have invested a lot of time and money and energy and all these things. Um, in your experience and with these projects, did that, did that energy and, and those sort of the multiple voices influence the project positively, negatively? Uh, did, it, did it encourage sort of a, um, a different level of spirit? You know, I, what, what, because it is a challenging thing to wrestle so many voices in a, in a cultural institution like this. So just curious, again, it comes back to the transitioning a little bit, but what, what are your thoughts on that? You know, interestingly, if I... Please. I do. think museum clients, to me, I think uh, it, was, it was not that conflicting. Mm -hmm. uh, I, had, I had experience, uh, for example, in a museum like Metropolitan Museum of uh, Art in New York, it's, there's a lot of people involved. Uh -huh. from different departments, the, from the director on, for example. But I, I didn't find that more complex or different than others. I think they could come up with consensus. It's a matter of leadership. Uh -huh. And other museums, too, that when there's a clear understanding and leadership there, and then I think, uh, actually, it wasn't that any more different than the university building. Than any other building, yeah. any other client, yeah. yeah. So it's consensus building. It's right. finding that, that, that position that satisfies I, all of the requirements. I, I personally, I didn't have that conflict yeah. of uh, different opinions as much. When I think, well, it's not necessarily that there are conflicting positions. It's just that there are multiple bodies involved. And I think it's interesting that you come at it this way because in some of the interviews that I've seen with you, you talk about sort of allowing the architecture and the art to sort of speak um, simply, right? That they, it is about creating an environment for the art. And if you sort of you know, register it in such clear, simple terms, it seems like that would be a, a simple situation. But I know it's not always a simple situation either. So it's, it's a question worth answering. And in some ways, maybe it's all leading to a question that will lead us into the next topic, which is, what is the role of architecture in a museum? So maybe I'll, I'll since Q's uh, fielded the last question, you can have that one, Brad. the other question. <laughs> I, I, I want to choose the other. I'm gonna you want to choose the other? Yeah, in fact, I'm going I'm to answer your other question first. Okay, it's, sure. a, it's an evasive maneuver. Um, this issue of client is, is it, I, was, I was ranting earlier 
about some projects we're working on and the relationships mm -hmm. with the client. And, the, and each project is so different, obviously. But I think the most important thing uh, for the architect and the possibilities of the architecture is that the client know what question they're asking. You know, if they can really present you with the, the no, it's not the problem, but the question, the question. Mm -hmm. of what, it's, what this institution is trying to do or aspiring to do and, and what they're asking of the architecture. And I think if everyone comes together and, and serves that, it makes a huge difference. Rather than it serving the individuals themselves, you know, the name donor or the, or the director or the, you know, the rebellious curators who are fighting against the director and all the other <laughs> social scenarios that one <laughs> Can encounter, but I think which it, can encounter in any kind of building, right? Well. But if the mm -hmm. leadership comes together, and whether it's the board or the director or whatever, comes together to, to form a a clear a clear goal for the building and the architect, then everyone's egos organize around that. I mean, I found that to be generally true. You know, that, that if there's a cohesion around what they're serving, it makes a it makes a huge difference. And now Kyusung will answer the meaning of art. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think if, I, if I may add also, I think... Uh, sure. Oh, oh, really? Okay. Oh, that's too bad. Sorry. Well, Sorry. Can thing, we I'd turn the volumes up as well? If you put the microphone closer to the yeah. What I'd like to add to uh, the museum clients is that when you're doing something good, they recognize, <laughs> and because it's not true for uh, they all different kind of clients. But I think uh, quite often I had that pleasure of, uh, because because it's it, you can build a consensus uh, when you come up with something mm -hmm. valuable. That's good. Yeah. Yeah. Now, should we now move to that other question? If you like. Really? It's, a, it's a little bit of a setup. It's a little bit of a setup. I mean, it's such a broad. It's such a broad question. It, it, it is. Um, it is. I mean, the easy answer. I'll do the easy answer and let Kisung do the hard one. Um, <laughs> I mean, every museum is different, right? So every, each relationship to the architecture and the art, it, it varies by the nature of the institution and what the mission and goals are, right? Um, I mean, I, I have a bias which I could speak to. You know, my, my bias is that the buildings, as I mentioned before, this word catalyst, I, use, I also use this term, it's in the search for language and architecture, I use this word amplifier, that if the building does its job right, no matter what the collection is, it sort of amplifies your, your sense of what the building holds and presents. It, you know, it, it, it sensitizes you or, or it opens you up in some fashion to be prepared to experience whatever form of art it is. Um, and I think that that can change, obviously, given the context. But I, th I think the building plays a very active role. It's certainly not passive by any means. But it is serving the art. I mean, that's, that's really the mission. I mean, it's serving the art and it's serving the community. And its role as a catalyst and an amplifier of understanding between those two bodies. Um, is, is very, very clear to me. And what's so exciting is it can take so many different forms in so many different places. Well, and maybe to be fair, okay. I think it's a good lead-in into the, the, the middle act, if you will, um, the topic rooms for art, which is a term that Lisa used when we first met, and it really resonated with me. Um, and in some ways, this is, I think, what we're really talking about. And um, so, Kyusung, um, how would you react to the idea or definition of rooms for art? Uh, I think, it, I, as Brad just mentioned, that the depends upon different kind of art, different kind of museum, different kind of program. Uh, some art requires more the experiencing it more isolation, and some would not. I mean, uh, for example, in my experience, like uh, Villa Real and uh, the doors are is very different art which requires different kind of context. So some requires more isolated experience, also need the setting. I think in that case, probably the rooms for the art is more appropriate. And some which do not. So I would think that depending upon the curatorial, uh, the, uh, the direction and art, uh, one can have 
in this case, again, that both instead of, depending upon, you can choose or having both uh, rather than one or another. Actually, myself, I myself have uh, done some as rooms for art, and in this instance was specifically for one uh, private, uh, the artist was a friend of mine. And, and the other one actually at the moment what you're doing is that uh, it's not, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a larger size of exhibit space in uh, actually Asia, the cultural complex. It's about 100,000 square foot. And it's not only not known about who is going to be uh, the, uh, the artist, but uh, they do not have even a pro program, and they are opening up potential for all different kind of medium. Mm -hmm. And this space is for the future, not for the contemporary now. Uh, in th that instance, I think uh, the approach was very different, yeah. that it's a huge space. For new media. Right. Yeah. For mm -hmm. new media. It can be uh, actually just a huge space which buildings or walls or spaces can be built afterwards uh, on, on infrastructure because that's the only way to give the maximum possibilities yeah. for the future. And I've actually been involved in a similar situation. Mm -hmm. Probably the most difficult thing I've ever had to do was be involved in a program for new media and they don't know what the new media is, so how do you begin to define a set of circumstance to house something that's... Big screens. To be, yeah, really exactly, big, big screens. screens, yeah. Brad, do you want to expand or add, or next question? It's a, it's a really interesting question, the, the rooms for art question, mm -hmm. because sometimes, like if we look at this building right now, you know, it's a, it's a somewhat tenuous definition of specific rooms, and it was intended to be that way. The kind of woven concrete, the you know little eight-inch intersections and the high and the low spaces. Um, but then the art makes the rooms. I mean, Ingo's piece makes the room. You know, the room wasn't there and now it is, right? And in that piece, well, the two pieces together, but the big piece specifically, it, it starts to make that space a defined set of relationships, gives it a scale and proportion that it didn't have before. And I, and I think it's exciting to think of certain spaces that the art makes the room, and you contrast that, as you were saying, with, with fixed collections, and with me, it's the Clifford Still Museum, where you're making rooms specifically for that art. Mm -hmm. And so, there's, I mean, the art still makes the rooms. <laughs> in, in that case, with those paintings, there's no question. But, but you're really serving very specific things and trying to enhance and amplify the, those specific relationships. But it's, it's, it's exciting in an open matrix like this to see how certain acts then organize the space in an entirely, entirely different way. And I love the McCall. I don't know who thought of installing the McCall right now, but it's perfect in, in relationship with the, the rest of the pieces that we put in. I mean, curation is not to, it's a little self-serving in this context, um, <laughs> but. But, but it really was, I, I was, you know, D Dominique's assistant more or less in this one. Um, but curation is, is, is everything. I mean, it makes such a difference. Well, well how why don't we take it there then? You know, to curate, um, by definition, is the careful and thoughtful organization of a series of items um, to convey a larger message or a sense of purpose, correct? Sounds, sounds good. Um, uh, well, maybe Kyosung, maybe you could field this first. At the Nerman, there is a body of work, a collection. At CAM, there's, there's not. So maybe you could start with, did the, the act of curating, the curatorial process influence that project? Or was it left to just create a series of rooms for, of art, for art? I think it's more later. That, the latter. Uh, right, yes. Uh, there's still there, the can everyone hear? Yeah. Yes. No? Still, oh, I see, okay. It's more latter that uh, it's a series of rooms and spaces, and then I think they're still collecting. Are we better now? Are we better? Yeah? Okay. Q Sung, why don't you repeat that just so we. Okay. The <laughs> <laughs> in case of Norman, that. Uh, <coughs> The spaces and uh, the uh, those were shaped first, and then uh, the 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 uh, curate uh, the uh, collection is keep uh, happening. So creating uh, these rooms for right, art took right. place, and then the curatorial process right, right. absorbed that right. context, right. if you will. But it's it's interesting if you think you know, there's been so many criticisms of MoMA 
um, mostly because it's just so big and now they're adding on. Mm -hmm. So I guess <laughs> they're still learning that lesson. Um, but you, you, you get larger museums where it's, it's not about rooms, it's about the, the, the circulation patterns. You know, it's, a, it's an on I mean, it's a, it's a... A loop. Yeah, it's a sort of problem that you can't win, actually. And now it may be completely unwinnable, but we'll see. But, you, you know, I think, I think depending on the nature of the collection and the scale of the building, it proposes different issues. I mean, I, I think large institutions and large museums are becoming more a management of circulation. They're almost airport designs as much as they are mm -hmm, mm -hmm. art museums. Can you move that and many, many people through? How many through? people can you move? Right, and if you don't keep moving, you sort of get trampled somehow <laughs> in, the, in the thing. But so there, there's just so many different ways of engaging the problems. I mean, and, and that's, a, you know, that, I mean, I'm being so facetious in so many ways and poking fun, but, but that's a problem with large institutions. I mean, you, you have to sort of distill what the issues are, right? And I, th I think art is, I mean, as much as the building is serving the art, art is part of it. Right, and and it's but it's a civic dialogue. I mean, it's it's about what role that building is playing to whom and how it's trying to adapt and enhance and engage some of those some of those larger cultural cultural issues. I mean, if if this building, it's it's so interesting. If I was commissioned to do this building today, it would be an entirely different building than it was 10 years ago or 13, 14 years ago when I was hired, because St. Louis is an entirely different place. It's an entirely different place than it was, and that, that affects the building. It affects the architecture, I think. Well, and you're a different person. That's right. And I'm, yeah, <laughs> and I'm much older and slower. Much older now and wiser now, correct? Yeah. <laughs> so maybe this is a short question. Then in either of your, um, in the process that you both went through on these projects, these re um, respective projects, was there any work in the collection or maybe here in the adjacent collection that was influenced, that influenced your, the project. So it's a curatorial question still, you know, how do you begin to create a space for a particular piece? But, but I think I'd like to add uh, another angle that the art, I think uh, the main purpose of museum is for experiencing art. But architecture itself has its role as well. I mean, not just the, uh, I mean, it's, uh, it's to the city, uh, for example, look at what this building is doing to the, this part of St. Louis. So architecture has in its own way, uh, in its own role, and also space itself and so forth. And it, what makes it more complex is that actually a building lasts much longer than 10, 20 years that we hope. So, so I think we have certain role, so how we, uh, how we make these things happen, and then I think comes how we interface between the art, which is the main, experiencing art, which is the main thing, and then architecture. That's interesting part of it, that how to connect one to another one. And I think depending upon uh, the site specific versus temporary or collection versus not collection, all those Puts, you know, comes into the picture and then architecture plays a certain role. And to me, I think uh, when it's well done, I mean, it's great to be able to see that architecture enhances the experience, mm -hmm. either by, you know, by nature or by connection to the city or... Uh, so I think the role of architecture and role of art, it, I mean, it has its own right, and I think we can connect somehow. So in some ways, what mm -hmm. you're suggesting is that the dialogue between architecture and curating mm -hmm. really is the thing that enhances the experience, right? Those two working together? The, I think in the process wise, I think some, in my experience, for example, I think some piece of artwork, uh, uh, namely the, uh, the Villarreal's, the, the, the uh, light art, that one I think was conceived even before the, uh, the artist was selected, but once, the, the right, right. Piece. Mm -hmm. but once I think uh, we have art artists on board, it was a terrific experience of uh, expanding my role much more than architects can do, and I think it worked out. For uh, everyone, the, if you, when you visit the Nerman, it's definitely worth going in the evening as well to experience what, what Kyu Sung is talking about. There's a uh, new media LED 
surface that's on the underside of the uh, overhang the, at where you enter. It's really quite extraordinary. I'm, go I'm going back to the previous question a little bit. Okay. And then I'll talk about um, the Sarah piece. Um, it, it's interesting as I was thinking about the question as the, as the discussion moved on is that I think what we all hope for, both the architects and the visitors, right, is to carry away a profound memory of a place, mm -hmm. yeah. right? If you go, it's, it's, if you think of the Met or the Louvre or, or MoMA in some cases, certainly in its expanded sense, I think it'll enter into this realm, is you can only experience fragments of those collections at any given time unless you're superhuman and you train for three months to do it, some kind of art marathon. But, but I think that's what's wonderful about those larger institutions is you, if they're done right, um, if they're done right, you can, you can engage them in fragments and kind of piece together those memories. And what's interesting in the larger institutions, I think, and it's a question for everyone to sort of reflect. Show of hands. Yeah, reflect upon, yeah, we can do a show of hands. But, but I don't, when, when, you, when you engage those larger institutions, it loses its kind of memory image of building, unless it's the front door at the Met and the big rotunda, right? And after that, it's really the collections themselves you carry away, right? You, you, you remember the a specific piece in a collection or, or at, the, at the V&A, that hallway with all the wrought iron work, that crazy hallway kind of, you know, who would install that that way? No one would install <laughs> that that way. You know, so you, it's not about the architecture and those larger things, but the memories. And I think it's the same with small museums. You, one would hope, you know, bet between the Pulitzer and here and, the Nerman and Clifford Still, that you, there's a kind of larger constellation of amazing moments that you have with art that really are the things that matter that you hold together in your experience of culture in that way. And it, it's a fascinating, I mean, it, it's a fascinating thing. And I think if you start with larger museums and then think of very idiosyncratic museums and how they kind of assemble together in your mind these memories of places you've been, it's, it's an interesting question, I think, interesting thing to think about. Well, it also dovetails on, on Kyusung's comment about the, the enhanced experience, our memory, mm -hmm. right, of the particular work is not of just the work itself, but it's the environment in which it's seen, the leading up to, right, it's the, the entire sort of um, moment that yeah. lends to that memory, right? And it's not necessarily the reality, and it's, it's how you perceive it to be. Well, I think the more, the more specific and idiosyncratic, I mean, the gardener, right? What a kooky place. I mean, it's, it's a very specific place, right? And therefore, the, the, the relationship between what you see, how it's hung, and the nature of the place itself are fused into one thing. And I, I think it, what that experience, and so it's certainly that melding of this very, very specific and idiosyncratic and the nature of collection is what I'm trying to serve more and more because I think there are those rare cases like that where the two things come, come together, where the, where the idiosyncratic and excruciating and specific nature of the architecture and the very specific art it holds are one memory, are one thing, inseparable, but it's so rare, mm. so, so rare, I think that that happens. Certainly keeps me striving. And also I think in this, uh, the small museums, is a great opportunity to have uh, this experience can come together. That uh, just as Brad mentioned, that it's larger museums, if you go, sometimes it's more like department store that you see the objects. But uh, small museums, art, architecture, nature, or even social sense, cultural sense, everything can come together, and then it can combine all those things as a wholesome experience. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what. Uh, the difference matters, and that's what really makes places interesting. Yeah. Well, I think that's a, maybe a nice lead into sort of a final question for this particular topic. Um, and maybe in some ways, uh, I'm going to offer a counterpoint to your sort of simple position that you've created these rooms for art, Kyusung, and that the cura curating came after. And I would argue that mm, you did curate the sequence in the Nerman. We can come to the come back to the contemporary in a second. Um, but when I think about defining the needs for a particular work or a piece of art, 
you, terms like territory and domain and vista and the ability to breathe, right? All of these things come, come into play. And one of the things I was struck by, many times I've been to the Nerman, is the way the, the galleries and the work reveal themselves. That it's not simply moving from rooms to room, but that you get glimpses, you get evidence of what's to come. Um, you know, I don't, would you mind sort of talking about sort of all of the moments and the aperture that, uh, that occur in that museum, different ways of experiencing the art and allowing well, these other things well, to occur? If I, I mean, we talk about the building art design, so maybe. <laughs> so, uh, the way I, this experience, the way I compose is, I, uh, a lot of cases, I consider closer more to music than uh, the art. To music, yeah. Right. Mm. The sequence really matters, and uh, the sequence really matters uh, how you move, and circulation is important, and I think those can be also choreographed with light, both daylight and natural light, and also views and, uh, and the incidences and those things. So that's the way I would like to think uh, when, uh, when I design a building. That's, and I think regardless if it's a museum or dormitories, it's, uh, Either way, I think I'm doing that, and that's where I approach where I like to connect. Uh, I see. Mm -hmm. But I think also interesting thing is that more and more that I mean, I, I really like this room, truly, because <laughs> you know, because I think uh, it has various it's kind of multiple meaning, multiple ways of working. First, I thought that this should be the seating, but it reversed, and this is stage, which is fantastic. Uh, and I think uh, the, the, the boundaries are, not the physical only, but the medium in many ways, I think we're getting more and more freer. And that gives us opportunity as an architect to uh, explore further, regardless of those situations. That's the way I feel, yeah. yeah. And Brad, I assume your answer is quite different here, that you know, this, this project, even though you might design it differently today, allows the, the collections, the work, whatever is being exhibited to reveal itself in any number of ways. Yeah, I was, I was thinking about your previous question as well. <clears throat> when, when I began the design of this building, you know, after spending some time in St. Louis, I wanted the, the boundaries of the building to be the wall of the Pulitzer and then the city. Right, I mean, part of the reason that window is there was to see all the way through to the wall of the Pulitzer, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and then in 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 you know with, with Richard's piece, which was introduced in the very very beginning, Joe, you know, it became a I mean, a literal hinge in where it was sited and a kind of fulcrum for that conversation both between this building and the Pulitzer, but then for me to be able to see it from the outside, right. So it, it extended the, the domain of this domain, building, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. right, from, as I have said many times, when you're driving to get a 12-pack of beer, <laughs> right, and you're stopping and you look in there and go, what the hell is that Rusty Hulk of thing, right, in the courtyard, that you get a sense that there's a life to this place and all of the different layers that, that blur those boundaries in some way. And, and as I said before, in a, in a building like this, um, it's really the art that has to hold those rooms and hold that space. And, and so in the beginning, all we had was the Pulitzer and Joe. That, exactly, was, yeah. that was it. So it became a kind of guiding piece. Yeah, I really love thinking about it as a hinge. And when we talked with Richard about where to cite it, I think he got very excited about it being a fulcrum between the two buildings as well. Mm -hmm. I'd like you, Song, to summarize the nature of architecture relative to art. Uh, 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 I was waiting for that. Because that's, that's the next one. That's the next. I think I did it many times. Yeah, you did. I think you did too. <laughs> well, let's let's move into our last topic here, and uh, and then we'll we'll end with some question and answer time. So we'll make sure to leave plenty of time for that because I'm sure there's questions from our audience as well. Um, but this, this notion of trajectories moving forward and intersections coming from uh, the current exhibition. Um, I don't know, this, this whole notion of life and, and the, the terms of memory are resonating with me for, at the moment. Um, 
I don't know, let's start with a, a, a tricky question, but is there a way in which this, the end project, the end result, um, sort of reflects the unique approach for that particular place, that time, whatever, um, you know, what you were listening to at the time, you know? Which band? Which band, yeah, exactly. Q Sung, we wanna? The, is that something you're able to, is that a, no, do you I mean, understand? Could explain it, I mean. Sure. Yeah. Does the end, does the project mm -hmm. and its end result reflect um, some unique quality at the time yourself, things that you were interested in, um, perhaps a conversation with that particular client, something that was in the collection? The, I think uh, the, I have a tendency not to think about at specific time as much as possible. Uh, again, I think I begin, I mean, my sense is that, uh, yes, it is time, but not the specific moment, but our time. Our time and uh, a specific place. And uh, the, in the case of Norman, I think maybe San Luis belongs a similar region, but it's, it's amazing from the airport to the museum, the driving of this, this huge, vast land. Uh, it's a really big plane. And the first time the, uh, when we talked about the site boundary, there's about 200 feet of uh, edge condition there. They said it's too tight. And for me, <laughs> 200 feet, I could build the entire museum there. Uh, so this sense of space was, was very different uh, from uh, what I had uh, back in Asia or in the East Coast. And uh, that really influenced me a lot for this building. Have any thoughts on that, or should we go to a different question? No, I have, I have thoughts. I can't okay. remember what band I was listening to. Um, <laughs> that one was directed. That's, yeah, that's the 10-year part. I can't remember much of anything, actually, up now. Um, but I, but it's interesting, the, the, the course of a practice and the, the nature of, a, of an investigation. And it, 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 that's really what it is, right? It's an investigation. Discovery. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's an investigation, and it, and it evolves, obviously, as as the opportunities arise, as, and as you learn more from built work. I mean, I've learned so much from built work. I think that's, that's a critical piece to, to the domain of architecture is that you have to build to really learn. Um, you know, we can speculate all we want, but boy, do you learn a lot when you, when you build these buildings. It's, it's, a, it's a real gift. But one of, the, one of the inspirations for me actually goes back to Richard Serra, too. And I, th I think about this a lot. Um, where Richard, you know, for a great part of his career, and Emmy would know exactly the dates and exactly the pieces, <laughs> so I apologize for that, not knowing that. But, you know, he, he started investigating steel, these enormous plates of steel, um, you know, mid-career maybe, early mid-career, I, I, I don't know exactly the time, but something he pursued for a very, very long time. And he did pieces, the piece that inspired me very early in my career at MoMA, where there was four plates radiating from the corners that didn't meet in the middle, and just transformed that space in the most spectacular way. Um, I mean, it, it really, it was one of the most pure investigations of material and space that I've ever seen. And then his voice got quieter and quieter, right? Still pursuing that material, still pursuing the possibility of those ideas, right? And there's a sort of amplitude to his career, which then exploded with the torqued ellipses and the torque spirals. Same material, same investigation, a kind of lifetime of thinking and pursuing a conversation that invented something entirely new. When I was in the spiral a couple of weeks ago, I, I, it's, it's space that you don't see anywhere but there. I mean, he really invented space you know, from just believing in a kind of conversation of ideas and one material and spending a lifetime thinking about it and pursuing it. It's just extraordinary. And so the discipline to not try to reinvent yourself, right? And not, and, and, and not, not sort of pander to novelty, right? But, but to try to understand maybe one or two things <laughs> about making an architecture. That's what I learned from Richard and the, and the kind of innovation that he's continued to, to create and encounter throughout his career. 
Well, and maybe not to make an overly general assumption, but I, I suspect that's a generalization about how you how you see your practice and, and its evolution. Yeah, I'm just I'm just trying to figure out I'm trying to figure a few things out. <laughs> it's hard. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's hard. hard. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It never gets easier. Um, well, let's move on maybe to a, um, a more open-ended discussion uh, topic. Um, it seems like um, today that we could argue that institutions like the Nerman and like the contemporary um, serve a very specific purpose, but that that purpose and that role is growing. Um, some might refer to this as the program for these institutions. Um, so even the smallest museum is big, and even the largest museums, maybe to your point earlier, Brad, is, has to be small because it still has to relate to the, to the individual. Um, so, you know, oppo as opposed to the gift shops and the cafes and all this stuff that sort of comes along with a museum these days, um, I don't know, let's talk about program as it relates to, tra tra to trajectory, the role of the community, and perhaps its increasing role in a community uh, that a museum does have. Where do you want to go first? Why don't you go first? Yeah, I was, I'll go first. Um, I, and I, you know, I spend a lot of my time in New York these days and uh, with the whole city bike program and I was asking someone the other day, and of course it's wonderful, and alternative modes of, uh, of uh, transportation are always good, I'm trying to be politically correct, um, but I was just wondering about why, does there, why is there a bike culture? I understand why there's bicycles, right? Bicycles are good, right? Alternatives to carbon producing vehicles is always good, but why is there a bike culture? And a, and a friend of mine said, because there's so few communities in our culture today, that there are actions that create community around them. And people are so interested in that and have such a need for community that they'll create a community about, around just about anything. <laughs> and, I, and I think, I'm sort of backing from the, from the common to maybe the to whatever we're talking about here to this evening, but I think one of the things that museums have, the role the museum has played for a very, very long time is that of creating a community, a specific community. I mean, you're all here tonight because you are the community of the Contemporary Art Museum, right? Or the, or, the, or the community <laughs> of design in St. Louis. And, and I think as much as we would love to believe that everyone comes to art museums to see art, and everyone comes to a contemporary art museum to, to experience the new and the evocative and the possible, uh, which is certainly a big part of it, um, as you all know. People seek out a sense of community. And I, th I think more and more the directors and curators of these institutions understand that, that what they're doing is, is trying to create a community around a certain action and activity. And it's something that we as a culture are desperate for. We're just desperate for that sense of community and we find it wherever we can. Wonderful so, response, Kusum, mm -hmm. yeah. I think the way I see, uh, I don't know San Luis that much, but uh, the way I see today, walking around here, these two museums here together becomes kind of catalyst, mm -hmm. focus that I think uh, the Contemporary Art Museum provide a focus that these things can happen, I think. Then the boundaries doesn't mean much because boundary in terms of uh, the medium, in terms of activities and so forth, that can be quite fluid, but just to be able to provide a focus that gives a very strong sense of uh, community. That's what I think. Do you see the role of the museum as an arts institution growing? And maybe this is a bit more for Brad um, as our education systems, especially publicly, are, are fighting for the arts, and there's this sort of always sort of conflicting thing. Are we going to privatize sort of the arts education? Well, that's that's a whole different discussion. I mean, that to me that raises the issue of the kind of political arm of the arts. Mm -hmm. That you know, in in times in reactionary times, um, whether it's reactionary where they decide where they decide arts don't matter in high schools and. In, in, in public schools or reactionary times of, of political spheres of influence like we live in right now. I mean, the role of art as a counter voice to that and as a propositional voice 
becomes increasingly important. Mm -hmm. So I, I think you're, I mean, I think what you're hinting at is the erosion of culture, or traditional culture, I should say, or traditional places and programs of culture. And I think that's directly tied in our, in our current times to politics. And, and I think the importance of, of artistic culture and production as a critical voice and a, and, a, and a counter voice to a lot of the things that are happening in our world are ever, ever, are more important than they've ever been in my lifetime. Mm -hmm. I mean, they're, they're being besieged, and I, and I think it's a voice that is absolutely critical. And, and I don't mean it to be a negative question, because I'm, I'm, my optimism is renewed, especially when my, uh, my five-year-old neighbor comes across, and I shared this with Lisa the other day, and says, you know, I'm, I can't wait to go visit the Contemporary this week, because they come every Saturday morning. You know, so um, the role of the institution and of this community that you've uh, that you've reminded us of. It really is maybe the centerpiece here that we're, we're getting at. Kyusung, do you add to any of this? I mean, it's a little bit of a, um, yeah. It's fine for me, though. <laughs> <laughs> OK. Yeah. Anything else? Well, I could, I'm, yeah. I, I, I'm sure. kind of getting on my high horse here now. Um, there was, there was an article, you know, I won't quote it specifically, in the Times this week. Uh, and it was, a, uh, it was about an individual involved in the culture of new technology. And there was an assertion in the way it was presented that the individual was quite proud of that they were, that they were going to a certain institution of learning and in a context where people you know, were talking about the great poets. And they were saying, uh, and, the, and the assertion was, I couldn't even name five poets. And it represented to me this idea that new technology doesn't need forms of traditional culture, that we don't need that to succeed at Google or Amazon, that we don't need to go to high school even. We can quit and become wildly successful millionaires. But it, it just it, it raises a question to me of what culture is and what the basis of thinking is, you know. And, do we really not need to know five poets? I actually think you do need to know five poets. And I think we're better to know five poets. I wish I could m remember poems like my friends can. That was something I've always aspired to. But I mean, that role of traditional culture in whatever form it takes, um, I, I think there's a superstructure of thinking that it asserts, you know, that, that obviously this place, you know, believes in that role of immediate culture, that you come and see five artists that you didn't know, right? right? And that's important to us as a, as, a, as a culture and as a community. It's just an interesting time. Yeah. Well, maybe the final question this evening, um, a spirited one. How did, um, maybe Kyusung, you could start. How did this, project, the Nerman in your case, how did it prepare you or influence you for a current work? I have to say that uh, having done another building in different location, I mean, obviously, I think my perspective expanded. Uh, beyond that, uh, uh, in my career, I mean, the way I designed the building and so forth, it's, it's another one that uh, I care all the pieces I, I think I'm trying to at least, and then I think this one is another one. And beyond that, I cannot say. Okay. Brad, any, any influences on your current work from, from this project? Yeah. Um, yeah, we, th this began, I guess there was, a, there was something I learned in the Wyden and Kennedy building, which is the first building I really built. It was a box with some eroded corners where concrete sort of barely touched. It was an ex existing building, wasn't it? Yeah, but we built a new building in the old building. Anyway, to refer to work that you may not know is, is, is a little bit. But th th there were things I learned in the space of that building, how the the, 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 the voids themselves became almost figures and amplified this, this question between the, the elements of the architecture themselves and the nature of the space. I actually tried to do a drawing for a long time of this to draw the space rather than the walls, to draw the resultant as a figure. 
I could never do it. I still wish I knew how to do it. Um, but there were, a, there were a lot of things I just learned and saw um, as the work progressed. And I think in, in many ways, the Clifford Still Museum is a, and I think it actually is, it's a, it's a summary piece to a lot of those ideas. It, it, it sort of brings a lot of those things not to closure, but kind of clarity in, in my mind. You know, it took 10 years, um, but it, it's interesting. Mm -hmm. and, now, and now I think there's a different trajectory to the work based on technology and representation and lots of other things, but still dealing with some of the same ideas, but in different ways. Well, I think that concludes at least my moderated portion of this evening. Um, so I would like to personally thank uh, Brad and, and Kusung for their candidness this evening. Um, and maybe a round of applause for them. Um, and so now we'll open up to, to question and answer. And I, we can sort of figure this out as we go along. But um, if you don't mind, I'd like to for Lisa Melandri to have the first opportunity for a question with our panel this evening. So I have a very particular and leading question, which is that Brad, you said there are things that you would do differently in this building now. <laughs> 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 what would you do? So just to make sure everyone heard, sort of wild success and, and the thing that didn't turn out quite as, ex as expected. <laughs> I think it's last call at the bar. <laughs> I need to go. <laughs> I feel like, actually, I have to say, I feel like the mission is accomplished. In a sense that in the suburban, uh, it's a quintessential suburban and in the Midwestern suburb. And it's a community college and this piece became uh, the, the focus. Uh, and I think it's kind of put uh, the city, I mean, the state of Kansas also, they want to have some uh, contemporary art museum and they succeeded it. And it got the energy built and uh, the, this, the county itself, about 600,000 people, they feel good about it. So those are all good one. And I think more than anything else, the ability to uh, make a gateway for the rest of the artwork. Those things actually was, I think I feel like I'm a translator that the mission was given, and I think those things were kind of accomplished. Uh, what would I have done differently? I think I have to go back to, to them again. What would they would like to be different? Because I truly think, uh, I think my practice actually, I feel, there, I've, I do take an attitude very much of one who works with the mission, and uh, if the, that premise is, uh, there's two, two things one can say, whether the basic mission has to be modified or the translation, either technique or result has to be modified. Translation part of it, I feel it's okay. <laughs> Questions? Am I, am I supposed to not, did I get, did I get out of that one? Right. I'm going I'm I'm to answer that one just because, see, when he gets to talk, I can actually get a moment to, to cover myself here. Um, th this building, in this building, what I think I was trying to do was to mediate a kind of vacancy that existed in this neighborhood uh, and to capture that vacancy in some way. So I think there was an urban vacancy that the building was attempting to engage um, and then, it, and then in, in so doing, creating a different kind of vacancy for this unknown collection of art. And I think in a very small building, it was aspiring to do a lot of mediation. And I think for me, one of the things I've never been sure about is the scale and, and how then 
that that building, you know, between the this enormous expanse of unbuilt St. Louis at the time to the individual and the works of art, how does the building help bridge that scale? And I, and I think it does sometimes successfully, certainly now with Ingo's piece, uh, and sometimes not. And so I think that question of scale and resolution of scale that the building produced or didn't is still an ongoing question for me. We've talked about that a little, a little bit. Maybe as a continuation of, of what you just said, earlier you said uh, if you were building the building today, you're a different person or you've learned, had a lot of different experiences. St. Louis has changed. How would you build this di building different or design this building differently today? Um, I, was, I was thinking about that over the course of the evening. Two, probably two fundamental ways. One, how it meets the street. You know, as the city evolved, the city's evolved in a, in a very healthy way much faster than I ever thought it, it would. It's kind of incredible how much has happened in the last 10 years, given where it was, I mean, to where it is now and where it's going. So I think how the building meets the street, I would, I would think about differently, probably more actively even than, than I did. And then I think, and this maybe is even more important, uh, the questions of programming. I, I know more about art institutions now, and I know, I know better the questions to ask of the institution itself. I think now I can serve the institution better than I did before because of, of just the accumulated knowledge of working with different institutions in different contexts and different collections. I, th I think I could have built a building. I th probably could have resolved some of the scale issues by really asking the institution, for, for instance, how much money will you have to actually put on shows to be able to mediate this scale? You know, it's, it's interesting, the Zumtor Museum in Bregenz, right? A series of four, three or four big rooms that require huge pieces of art or really significant shows. And they have the money and the programming to do it. You know, they can fill that a whole floor with a single Matthew Barney piece which I saw there, which is just incredible, you know. So to create a building of a, of a certain scale with a certain vacancy, it takes a lot to animate it and keep it filled. And see, those are questions I didn't know, you know, I didn't know to ask that. And I hadn't seen the institutions to even have a reference point like that. So I think that's also part of the thing that's important. Um, the, su the superstructure of thinking, that was, that was a great um, um, sentence. Um, if art is rooms, if our art museum is the rooms for art, I'm really curious to hear about your des design decisions, let's call it that way, about how the other end works. In other words, how it reaches out to the city. Mm -hmm. so, um, so there is like the intro, the, 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 the thing inside and the thing that reaches outside, mm -hmm. which you refer, use words like as a catalyst, idiosyncrasies. Um, each city is different, has its own um, idiosyncrasies. I re I'm really interested to know how you research that and how that has changed over the years. Is the question for Kusum? Both. For so really, in simplifying, mm -hmm. art museums, rooms for art, so that's the inside. Mm -hmm. How do you make your design decision of that, what shelters it out towards the rest of the city? I think different, I'll, I'll go first this time so you can, you can take the time to make a better answer than mine. Um, <laughs> It varies on the institution, again. Yeah, it's been fun to, to, you know, as the conversation's gone on, to it's given me a lot to think about. Because in, in some cases, I think that if it's a major civic, you know, we're doing this building, the National Music Center of Canada, a building that represents the, the aspirations and the history of culture of music for a country. So the building has to become it has to have an image to convey a national significance. I think the building does. 
you know, Denver Art Museum, you know, right or wrong, it's aspiring to an object that represents the cultural aspirations of a city. I think that's different than the Contemporary Art Museum St. Louis or the Clifford Still or the Nerman. You know, I mean, it, it really depends on what place of memory that institution is trying to serve. I, I mean, I think, I think in a lot of these major institutions, there's the image of the building, you know, as quote, icon, the overused term now, right? And it's almost completely disconnected from the art experience on the inside. But maybe that's okay. You know, maybe those buildings of, of that civic scale and importance need to exist at those two levels, right? So you have that memory of the decorative arts collection at the Met that really doesn't have anything to do with the rotunda and the, and the big portico and the steps, right? There are two distinct memories where I think in institutions like this, they become more of one thing. And maybe, and then this really is a question, and maybe the exterior representation or image of the building is less important if it's not aspiring, you know, to represent a city or a state or a country, you know, that it's a more introverted and or inverted experience. I don't know, it's, it's a really interesting question, I think. Well, the, uh when you talk about room for the art and the exterior condition, I think I'm going to touch a little bit different area in the sense that uh, I think museum, I mean, we'd, we have two elements, so the walls and openings. And we always struggle how to use both of it in an effective way uh, because with the walls, one form or another, whether it's temporary or permanent or the exterior one or through the glass, those make inside more restful and it's kind of confined experience which is disconnected, which we needed. At the same time, in, especially in contemporary world, that the connection is very important. I mean, this is fantastic to have this connection. I think uh, the, the experience, I'm going back to the experiencing that art experiencing, actually occasionally it's good to have experiencing others like, land, the, like nature or like the city. It's okay, it's not conflicting completely. So we're dealing with uh, struggling all the time, uh, I mean, trying to find a way to link yet cut it off. Uh, that's the, I think that's it. That's the what uh, we work basic dealing with city. I think yes, it is true. We have to make some statement from outside, but actually for function reasons that we use both of it. Yeah. It's, also, it's also, it's interesting because Q Sung and I both, I think in these two projects that we're discussing, you know, the buildings are conceived of being very open and very accessible. You know, th this about the city of St. Louis, his building about that community of students and education. And, but, but there's also a place for the sort of theater, I think. I mean, again, this is a question, I'm not so sure about this one. But where, where there, you know, when you walk through that threshold, I mean, you, you, you go to the Met, you go to these other buildings, you don't see inside, right? It's absolute control, absolute control. There's an imagery applied to the facade, and I think you could, that conversation of applied imagery goes you know, from the Beaux-Arts to a lot of contemporary buildings that we all know today too, right? Where there's a real disjunction between the imagery of the exterior and then the actual experience on the inside. But so do theaters have that disjunction. And so maybe that role you know, where, where it's not all about sort of presenting it all all the time, but, but sort of taking people through really specific you know, separate experiences of art that somehow, again, as I was mentioning earlier, play a role in your memory, but are not so tied to the architecture. Yeah, it's, it's an interesting one. How much, how, much of, how much of museum design is theater and how much of it is really landscape and community? And, and it's not an either or either. I, th I think it's the range of discussion that's really fascinating there. I think we have time for one more question. Maybe one from a student. I know we have a lot of students here. Sorry, we'll go right here. Um, I was wondering, uh, you spoke a lot about the influence of the art and the institution and the curator in your work. And I was wondering about, um, especially in cases such as this with contemporary art, where these artists are still alive and they're working, do you ever consult with artists about your work during the process? Uh, my so however many museums I've done I'm gonna be very honest about this actually 
The directors generally don't let us. Uh-huh. Lisa wasn't involved in the It's a charged conversation because if you talk to one artist, you're biasing, right? I mean, I've always wanted to collaborate with artists from the very beginning, you know, to have a conversation, but to choose, you know, Doug Aiken, Ann Hamilton, whoever, it, it privileges them in a way in the whole conversation that it becomes a political issue for the director and curators. So they generally just stay away from it. It's so sad you know, to be able to do these buildings and not have those conversations. But it's like, I, apparently it's some sort of political time bomb that, that, that the institutions tend to avoid. Q Sung, do you want to do? Uh, <coughs> I think other than the true collaboration, I didn't have much contact with artists. Mm -hmm. Why, well, I think with that, we wait, need to close. He's, wait, he's, he's, he's going to cry if we don't. Okay. <laughs> okay, one more. One more. Yeah, Micah. Wait, wait, wait. wait. Uh, it's something that's been touched on. I just wanted to um, go a little deeper into this idea of um, new media, the future, your perception of what may happen in the future in your building. Is there a kind of, how do you kind of set a limit to the flexibility? I mean, I see this building as incredibly flexible. I come one day and you can see out, and then another day you can't. You know, one day you can see up into the back of house and another day you can't. And then of course the way the space is used, the walls that can be built. How do you kind of just set the parameters for that flexibility and then how much do you think about how much the building could change even maybe beyond mm -hmm. just the walls uh, of, the, of the gallery spaces? Summary of the <laughs> the <coughs> actually, the most flexible thing is not to do anything. If you leave as a vacant land, you can build later, and it's all flexible. No, uh, I'll, 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 ec I'll echo that. I think clear limits are one of the most flexible things you can ever do. I mean, some of the most restrictive buildings built in the 17th and 16th century have been used in so many different ways. You know, and, and I, think, I think it gets back to making just places of memory that are evocative that people want to do things in. And they'll do whatever form of art they can possibly, I mean, we, we talked about that here. You know, artists love to do work here. And I think if there's one success I would take away from this project, it's that. That if it's a place artists want to make work, the building will find its own home that way. And if it gets modified and become something else, that's, that's the nature of the building as a catalyst. That's exactly what one would aspire to. I think with that, join me in thanking Brad and Kyo Sung for their insightful commentary.